Um, well, we're a little shortly after 1 p.m., so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today's prototype phase informational webinar for the L Prize. We are so excited that you are here joining us. We're excited that you're interested in the L Prize, and we can't wait to tell you all about this phase. Next slide. Just a few items of housekeeping before we jump in today. Um, if you are joining us as an attendee, you will be on mute throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A panel. Note that this is different than other options that you might have. Um, it's, we will be monitoring, monitoring this Q&A throughout the webinar um, and answering questions as we are able. We do also have time at the end of today's agenda for a live Q&A. Um, however, please note that while we do encourage all uh, um, all of your questions, some of our, the more complicated or technical questions, we plan to follow up with a more thorough written response via, via the FAQ that's posted on HeroX. We'll also post any other questions that we may have answered live there. Um, we will be sure to notify everyone who has signed up for the webinar as well as the broader HeroX Prize community when, this, when the recording of the webinar has been posted as well as when the Q&A has been posted. So again, enter those questions into the Q&A, and we will be happy to answer all of your burning questions about the L Prize. Next slide. All right, so our speakers today. Hi, I'm Emily Evans. I'm from the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, I'm joined today by Wyatt Merrill from the U.S. Department of Energy, Gabe Arnold from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, as well as Kate Hickox from the Pacific, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as well. On the prize, um, the National Renewable Energy, we're pleased to serve as the prize administrator, providing day-to-day -day support to the prize. The prize is, of course, sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy, and technical direction and prize leadership is coming from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and we're all really excited to talk to you today. And with that, it is my pleasure to pass things over to Wyatt from the U.S. Department of Energy. Wyatt, over to you. Thanks, Emily. Can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you great. I see nods. Great. All right. Well, I'm just going to spend a few minutes orienting us uh, in terms of where we're at in the prize, uh, where we've come from, where we're going, and I'll turn it over uh, shortly to uh, Gabe and Kate to walk us through some of the more specific details of this phase, our prototype phase. Um, not sure if I have control of the slides. Uh, do I? Okay. Uh, so uh, last year we made four awards for our concept phase, um, which uh, was uh, a nine month phase um, and uh, got some, some great uh, concepts uh, for, for the, the first phase. Um, but now we're really putting, uh, put, putting applicants to the test to, to come up with a prototype uh, that we can test um, uh, uh, for uh, all sorts of functionalities, which we'll, which we'll detail in a moment. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, is, is the second of three phases, um, the third of which um, will, will be a, a $10 million prize pool of up to four winners uh, for manufacturing installation, and I'll say a few words about that. Uh, overall, across all these phases, we really see uh, the, the L Prize um, as an opportunity to drive uh, uh, energy savings and and the uh, benefits of connected uh, lighting systems uh, in commercial spaces, uh, where we 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 know uh, uh, that there is still a lot of uh, energy left to be saved uh, in this space. Um, and, and where uh, some of these connected functionalities uh, can, can be maximally beneficial. And so uh, uh, to that end, uh, across all these spaces, we are targeting commercial uh, uh, lighting systems uh, in six categories uh, in particular, and, and we'll get into much more detail on each of these in a moment, but um, uh, we're looking at, of course, uh, as always, uh, uh, high efficacy, good quality light, um, in addition uh, to connectivity and, and interoperability uh, uh, for, for those uh, connected systems, um, uh, we, we have uh, components of our judging criteria uh, 
covering uh, product lifecycle and materials uh, choice. Um, we have special uh, points awarded for, for certain technical innovations. Uh, and then we have uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion component. Um, and, and all of these uh, are uh, really, really uh, form the, the, the overall picture of what we're looking for in next generation uh, lighting uh, luminaires in commercial spaces and represent, I think, a tremendous opportunity still in the space um, uh, to innovate. And so uh, having concluded our concept phase, uh, we're now uh, looking for applications from uh, uh, researchers, small startups, small and large manufacturers for this second phase of up to $2 million uh, prize pool, uh, up to six winners, um, and, and really emphasizing uh, techno technological innovation uh, and, and, and challenging teams to, to push the limits of what's possible with lighting. Um, the next phase, which we uh, uh, are going to launch, uh, we, we really uh, uh, would love to get your feedback on around uh, future manufacturing and installation. Um, so this is uh, going to continue to, to raise the bar for, for all the, the same innovation requirements that we're looking for in the prototype phase, but with um, additional uh, incentives and requirements around U.S. content and assembly, installations in the U.S. and innovative uh, deployment models where we really want to see these uh, uh, you know, in, in the real world uh, deployed. And if you have um, uh, uh, interest in, in, in this phase coming up uh, after phase uh, two, uh, we, we invite you to uh, provide comments for the phase three rules uh, through our HeroX website. Um, I think we'll hear more about uh, that website throughout the discussion today. Um, there's a lot of great resources there for uh, uh, learning more about this prize um, uh, and communicating with, with our team. And then finally, I wanted to mention that there is, um, for, for institutions that might benefit from uh, working together with uh, other institutions, we, we do have a, a RFI for specifically for teaming in, in, in phase three. Uh, and uh, we encourage you to, uh, to check that out and, and take advantage of the teaming process um, uh, as we get closer to them. Uh, so that's all live right now on the HeroX website. You can go check that out. Um, but I think today what we're really here to discuss is, is more this uh, phase two and uh, the rules that um, we, we've worked, uh, you know, with this team and others to, to, to refine um, uh, and, and now hope to uh, turn over to, to all of you to, to bring innovations to the table. Um, I'm not able to advance the slide now, it seems like. Uh, Gabe, are, are you uh, back in control? I am. Thank you, Wyatt. All right. Well, I'll turn it over to you to, to get into more detail on the, on the rules themselves uh, and, and the prototype phase overview. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, so this is Gabe Arnold. I'm, I'm with Kate Hickox here, and we're both at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. And we're going to tell you more about this prototype phase specifically that's currently open. We have got some exciting changes to announce with this phase uh, from the prior draft phase rules that were published with the concept phase. Uh, so first of all, uh, one of the big changes is that we now have two tracks. There is one track for luminaires and one for connected systems. You can submit to one track or the other track, or you can actually submit to both tracks. Uh, secondly, we've increased the number of potential winners of this phase from four to six. And third, we've expanded the innovation opportunities that uh, can earn points and help win the competition. All of these changes are, are designed to offer more pathways and opportunities to participate, to be recognized for innovation, and win the Prize awards. Um, anybody can enter this phase, and we're really inviting and welcoming new participants. The way to think about this Prize structure is that each phase is like a separate competition. We've heard some misunderstandings out there that only concept phase winners can participate in the prototype phase, but that's not true. Anyone can participate. So we've just opened this prototype phase as of June 30th, and it has this new dual track approach. Here's what the two tracks look like. The luminaire track is on the top and the connected systems track is on the bottom. The luminaire track has requirements and innovation opportunities in six different areas, um, efficacy, quality of light, connectivity, product life cycle, technical innovation, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. The categories for the connected systems track follow the same structure, but there's, there's only four. 
its connectivity, product lifecycle, technical innovation, and again, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then under each of those categories, you'll find either, you'll find a bunch of different topics that contain either mandatory minimum requirements that any winning solution must meet or optional points you can earn, or in some cases, a combination of the two. Um, you don't need to, to read all the details here on this slide under each category. We're gonna go through, through these in more depth in a couple of moments. So more about the structure here and, and how you win this and how we'll evaluate submissions. Uh, we have these two tracks and as I said, you can submit to, to one or you can sit, submit to the other or you can even submit to both. So it could be possible for one entity to receive an award for both tracks, but these would be distinct entries. One would be a luminaire, one would be a connected lighting system. And a connected lighting system is like a lighting control system. When you submit an entry, it will be reviewed by an expert reviewer panel. Now this is a group of independent experts and thought leaders that we have assembled with expertise in all of the relevant topics to the L Prize. They are going to both review your entry in person, uh, conduct a physical evaluation, and then they'll also conduct the documentation evaluation. And they will recommend winners to DOE, and the winners that they'll recommend will be the submissions that both meet the minimum requirements and earn the most points. And there's a couple of different categories of points to be earned. There are prescriptive points, where the L-Prize rules defines a specific threshold to meet, and you earn a predefined number of points if you meet that threshold. There are also some points that are more subjective in nature, where the expert reviewer panel will score a particular area of innovation on a scale of zero to five or zero to 10, and they'll assign additional points to a submission. Uh, these more subjective points, they're based on clear value statements that the reviewer panel will score, and you'll see those statements defined in the rules. Um, all of these points, so the prescriptive ones and those that are scored by the expert reviewer panel are added together, and the highest totals are what would be recommended to DOE as winners. Uh, so Kate and I will, will point out these different types of points as we walk through the requirements. What we'd like to do here is, is, uh, is really give you an overview of these requirements and innovation opportunities in each of the different categories. Uh, shown on this slide is a helpful table that you'll find in the official rules. Uh, this is table three. It spells out in summary form the minimum requirements and points op earning opportunities for the luminaire track, uh, specifically for the prototype phase. So let's go through these one by one, and I'm gonna cover the first three here, efficacy, quality of light, and connectivity, and then Kate is gonna cover product life cycle, technical innovation, and DEI. Uh, so we'll start with efficacy, and this one is very straightforward. The minimum requirement is that any uh, L Prize winning luminaire must be at least 150 lumens per watt. And this is an area where you can earn some additional prescriptive points. If you get above 150 to 160, then you'll get four points. 170 lumens per watt is eight points, all the way up to 200 lumens per watt, which can get you 20 points. Uh, so this one's very clear, very, very easy to understand. Uh, the next category is quality of light. Uh, DOE is looking to uh, really encourage innovation that is going to deliver both high efficacy and excellent lighting quality, and, and really to overcome the trade-offs that have existed between those two historically. There are five topics here where it is only mandatory minimums and no extra points that can be earned. Uh, chromaticity, dimming range, glare control, light output, and spectral power data. So those are represented in the, on the left side by the check marks. Um, some of these are very straightforward. So for chromaticity, the CCT of the submitted luminaire must be 4,000 K. Uh, the luminaire must be able to dim the 5% or lower. Uh, light output must be greater than 2,000 lumens. You must provide SPD data in five nanometer increment or, or smaller increments. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about the glare requirement. The glare control requirement, it uses a metric uh, called UGR, Unified Glare Rating, if you're not familiar, 
where we say you need to have a value that's less than or equal to 22, uh, more specifically, less than or equal to 22 and at least 90% of the standardized applications that are specified by a standard root reference called CIE 190-2010. And uh, we want to acknowledge here that there are some concern out there, especially among luminaire manufacturers, with the UV UGR metric being misunderstood or misapplied or used out of context with respect to luminaires. The issue is that UGR is really not a luminaire metric. It, it's, it's really an application metric that is calculated not just based on the properties of a luminaire, but also considering the space or application that it's installed in, including things like uh, the background luminance, reflectances, room dimensions, and other factors. Uh, the standard CIE 190-2010, what it does is it defines some standardized spaces or applications in which UGR can be calculated and produce a UGR table for that luminaire in those specific predefined applications. Uh, for the purposes of the LPRIZE, these predefined applications that standard are, are pretty well aligned with the applications that we're targeting in commercial and institutional uh, sectors. Uh, so the LPRIZE is, is requiring this UGR less than or equal to 22 in these predefined applications, about 90% of them predefined in the standard. Uh, some of the lighting software, such as Photometric Toolbox, uh, has these applications kind of pre-programmed in to where you can just input an IES file into that software and it will produce a UGR table that can be used for your LPRIZE submission. But um, it's important to know that the UGR values of a luminaire could be very different in some real-world applications that are different from the, the predefined applications in the CIE standard. And we recommend that if you're doing an actual project design, UGR should be calculated for that specific application. You shouldn't rely just on these UGR values that are predetermined in these tables from the CIE standard. We just wanted to make sure that we're providing the context here for how and why we are using this UGR metric uh, in the LPRIZE, and we don't want to encourage the incorrect usage of this metric uh, by others. So there's a lot more about this in the glare control section of Appendix A of the LPRIZE official rules, and uh, you can check it out there. Um, okay, so then moving on to the next um, topics, color rendition and temporal light modulation or flicker. These are a couple of topics where there's both mandatory minimum and additional points that can be earned for going beyond the minimums. Uh, the color rendering requirement uh, references the IES uh, ANSI TM30 metrics. You must have a preference rating of P2 and a fidelity rating of F3. If you're not familiar with these metrics, this is roughly aligned with where some 90 CRE CRI LEDs are today to give you a sense of kind of where we've set this bar. And then you can earn five points if you can do better than that with a preference rating up to P1. Uh, flicker, you must have a stroboscopic visibility measure, SVM of less than 0.9. Uh, you can earn five points if you get it down to 0.4. And then finally, white tunable. This is entirely optional, and there's, there's no points actually associated with it for the prototype phase. In fact, the LPRIZE for the prototype phase will only evaluate a white tunable luminaire at 4,000 K, and the luminaire must be configured that way um, for single CCT operation for the purposes of evaluation. Okay, and then the third topic I'll cover on the luminaire track is connectivity. Uh, for the luminaire track, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to provide a standardized D4i or ANSI C137.4 compliant driver, a standardized uh, shape and size sensor port uh, that's specified by Zogabook 20 or NEMA 20000-2021, certain shapes within that NEMA standard. Um, and a standardized wire connector that a sensor would plug into. Um, these standardized approaches, what they do is help ensure the digital interoperability of any winning luminaire with a wide variety of available connected control systems and sensors. DOE's goal with the cell prize is to support the widespread deployment and adoption of winning luminaires and innovations, as well as to support the advanced features of interoperable connected systems. 
And so this standardization really helps support that adoption and the advanced capabilities of connected systems. There are off-the-shelf drivers competitors can use with their Luminaire submission that meet these standards, uh, or a competitor could choose to develop their own. Uh, so that's it for connectivity. I'll go ahead and pass it over to Kate to cover product lifecycle. Great, thanks, Gabe. Okay, so uh, this is showing the uh, Luminaire lifecycle section of the L Prize. It's a little crowded because I wanted to drop in some definitions in there. Um, we're using the terms material transparency and material health, so you can uh, read how those are defined there. Um, and I'll just go over some of the uh, options or requirements for this section. Um, so you can see from the column on the left that the first two bullets on the list are required. Um, there's check marks uh, in the left-hand column. So, so there's requirements for um, a minimum driver lifetime and chromaticity maintenance, and you can see those on the on the top two bullets there. Um, the next two bullets on the list have both minimum requirements and optional points available. So uh, in terms of um, lifetime, uh, you can get, uh, there's a minimum requirement, uh, L70 of 50,000 hours, but you can also get points earned if the L90 is greater than or equal to 36,000 hours. Um, so there's two points available for that. Um, and then there's uh, a minimum and, a, and a optional points related to uh, circular design requirements. And so um, this centers around the use of the TM66 circular, circularity assessment tool that was developed by SIBC. Uh, and this talks about circular economy. So that's the idea of keeping products in use for as long as possible in order to minimize material extracted uh, from the earth. So, um, you know, one approach towards sustainability is making lamps and gear replaceable. That's just one little part of um, achieving a circular economy in a luminaire design. And TM66 is a great tool that outlines a comprehensive set of principles. And it also gives you a score at the end of, of that um, process using the spreadsheet tool. So um, we're looking for a minimum score of uh, greater than or equal to one using the TM66 circularity assessment tool. And uh, then you can get additional points for getting a higher score than that. And so um, that is something where you would, you would send in the full uh, spreadsheet tool and we would assess uh, those results and we would assess the, the number score that you received. Um, and the last bullet here is uh, not required, it's points only. And this is one that would be judged subjectively based on the materials um, that are submitted and the sustainability in innovation uh, that we see in the product. So here there's a lot of points available. Competitors can earn up to 10 points. Um, and so, so some examples of innovations that might support improved material transparency or improved material health might include um, innovations that use recycled, bio-derived, or low toxicity materials, um, innovations that reduce the use of harmful materials, such as PVC, uh, innovations that might reduce recovery processes, like shredding or burning, and would therefore increase recycling processes, um, or maybe innovations that include labeling of parts or components or other information that would communicate better end-of-life strategies. So those are just some examples. There's more examples if you go into the rules document. And of course, we're looking for innovation there. So we wanna hear your ideas and processes and, and what you come up with. Next slide. So for the technical innovation section, here's where we're looking for technical innovation that's beyond the prescriptive minimum requirements and the associated points that Gabe already outlined. So uh, again, this technical innovation is gonna be scored by the expert reviewer panel based on the criteria that we outline in the rules document. And there's no minimum, uh, no minimums that are required. So each of the bullet points here can earn you up to five points for a total of 15 points uh, under the technical innovation area. Um, and there's a few of these uh, subjective points earning opportunities. So for these different subjective points sections, the competitors, submitted documentation is gonna be judged by the expert reviewer panel based on the quality of the content, the approach, the arguments that are made, and on a very clear scoring statement 
that's detailed in the rules document, uh, Appendix A or B. So uh, what you see here, uh, the three bullets are the um, are what we've written the scoring statements about. So there's a clear scoring statement about application efficacy, about form factor and aesthetics, and about value proposition and cost. And so you can write your documentation to those um, scoring statements. And that's what the uh, expert reviewer panel is going to look at. So a couple of examples here, um, we're prioritizing innovations that lead to increased adoption of high efficiency, high quality and interoperable luminaires. And so some examples from the rule document that might fall into that category might include innovations that deliver exceptional in-application glare performance while maintaining high efficacy and excellent distribution of light uh, beyond what was um, described in the LPRIZE minimum prescriptive requirements, um, or innovations that improve the value proposition or cost effectiveness to design, install, or purchase this kind of high efficiency, high quality luminaires, and something that would lead to increased technology, technology adoption. So those are just some examples. There's more in the rules document. And Again, we're looking for your innovations there. Next slide, thank you. And so this is the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion section of the LPRIZE. And so this section is looking for policies and programs that promote the representation and participation of different groups of individuals, including people of different ages, races, ethnicities, abilities, disabilities, genders, religion, cultures, and sexual orientations. And so this section, again, is going to be scored by the expert reviewer panel based on the criteria and the rules document. There's no minimum or minimums required. Um, and the same as the last section here, each of these bullet points can earn you up to five points for a total of 15 points that could be rewarded for your DEI approach. And so there's a, a clear statement written about uh, each of these three bullet points. So um, we're looking for information about DEI plans and protocols or DEI gaps and opportunities, and um, DEI uh, deployment application. So um, just a little bit about each of those. Um, for plans and protocols, we're asking you to show a thoughtful and considered DEI approach to the plans and protocols um, of the organization and um, show some actual or planned impact. Um, for gaps and opportunities, we're talking about how competitors um, can demonstrate growth and iterations in a DEI approach and how gaps and opportunities uh, for DEI um, changes could be uncovered within the organization. And then finally, um, for deployment and application, we're looking to see a demonstration of a thoughtful or considered DEI approach to how the products are deployed um, and how the application of the lighting system could be uh, modified based on research and data. And so we're aware that this topic might already be very well built into the fabric of some organizations and in other companies, it might be unfamiliar or something that people are uncomfortable um, talking about or don't feel like they have the vocabulary. Um, and so in the LPRIZE rule document, Appendix E, there is a lot of supplemental guidance on this topic with lots of examples outlining various approaches that could support improved diversity, equity, and inclusion in organizations, systems, or deployment of lighting. And um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to the NREL LPRIZE email, and you can also stay tuned. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but we have some more uh, webinars coming up about these topics. Gabe, back to you. Okay, so let's move on to the connected systems track. And here is a summary table that comes from the official rules. This is table four, and we only have four categories for connected systems. It's connectivity, product lifecycle, technical innovation, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, there's some similarities between the two tracks here. Uh, I'm gonna cover the first uh, topic and then, or category, and then Kate will cover uh, the other three. Uh, so probably not surprising on the connected systems track, there are a lot of requirements and points opportunities in the category of connectivity. Uh, first up on this list is a standards-based luminaire system controller and standards-based luminaire level lighting control. So similar to the luminaire track, this references digital interoperability standards between luminaires and connected systems, referencing those D4I or ANSI C137.4 standards, which are effectively the same. The connected system must be able to control and communicate with a luminaire or sensor um, that 
I think that should be driver sensor that, that complies with a D4I or ANSI C137.4. And any connected system entry must provide a sensor to be installed in a luminaire uh, that is compliant with those standards and fit into kind of the, the standard shape and size sensor port. Uh, similar to the luminaire track, this will mean that any winning connected system will be digitally interoperable with a wide variety of luminaires on the market to help support the widespread adoption of the solution. Another outcome of this is that any winning L-Prize luminaire should technically be digitally interoperable with any L-Prize connected system. That's not something we're gonna be evaluate. We're not gonna take one competitor's connected system and, and evaluate it and you know, connect it to another winner's connected luminaire. But, but technically the goal here is for those to be interoperable as they might be deployed in the field. And so that's gonna provide a lot of benefits as DOE looks to support the, the deployment and widespread adoption of these winning solutions in the market. Uh, then next up is another flavor of interoperability. Uh, connected systems are required to have an API, an API that provides access to zone, occupancy, faults, and energy data that can then be shared with other non-lighting systems. Uh, next on the list is then addressability. The connected system must have addressability such that all luminaires and devices have unique addresses and can be individually controlled. Uh, the system must have energy measurement and reporting capability. It must be able to do four lighting control strategies at minimum, task tuning, occupancy sensing, scheduling, and daylight harvesting. You know, some of these are very straightforward and more common practice, but it's important to ensure that any winning system has them. And so that's why they are part of the LPRIZE rules. Uh, next up is a topic called system resilience, where uh, you must meet a minimum and you can also earn some additional points. At minimum, what this says is that any winning system must maintain control functionality after it temporarily loses connection to the network or power. And then you can earn eight points if the system maintains control functionality after losing connection to the next higher element in the system topology, oftentimes a gateway, uh, right? You don't want your lighting control functionality going down if your gateway goes down. And that's really what we're after and what we mean by system resilience. Uh, then next is fault detection and diagnostics. Um, this says the system must be able to report basic faults, um, like the lum a luminaire is not working, it's offline, and send notifications about that to a building operator. And then you can earn additional prescriptive points if your system can actually diagnose those faults to say what caused them, or more specifically what's wrong, or even predict faults, predict when something's going to fail. And then the final thing on the list is grid services capable. And this is, this is really about demand response. Uh, the system at a minimum must be able to do basic demand response to dim or control lights in response to an open ADR 2.0A signal from the utility. And then you can earn points if you take that to the next level for advanced demand response. Uh, so for example, the ability to receive a price signal from the utility using uh, the open ADR 2.0B standard and controlling the lighting in a more advanced way, in a more dynamic way, responding to that price signal while maintaining good lighting for building occupants. Uh, so these are all the connectivity requirements for the connected systems track. And of course, there's a lot more detail about these in the official roles, especially in Phoenix B. Uh, so Kate, you're up next with uh, product lifecycle. Great, so um, yes, product lifecycle for the connected systems. Um, again, this is uh, points only, and so this section is um, judged subjectively based on uh, life cycle and sustainability innovation, and you can earn up to 10 points in this section. So here, again, we're looking for innovations that support positive environmental impacts, such as improved product circularity, improved end-of-life outcomes, or reductions in the use or extraction of harmful materials, and um, improved material transparency. Um, so again, for these types of sections, it's subjective. 
the competitor submits documentation that's judged by the expert reviewer panel based on the quality of the content, the approach, and the arguments, and on a clear scoring statement that's detailed in the rules document appendix A or B. And so in this case, there's a clear scoring statement written about the uh, life cycle and sustainability innovation. Um, so we're looking for sustainable connected systems that support um, uh, equitable benefit of society and life cycle innovations that address circular economy by designing out waste and pollution and keeping products and materials in use for as long as possible. So um, just a few examples that um, could support this kind of innovation would be uh, innovations that restore, renew, or revitalize their own sources of energy or materials, um, innovative approaches to quantify material sustainability impacts or communicate those to end users, or maybe innovations that utilize design for disassembly rules or approaches, uh, for example, increasing material purity or reducing assembly or disassembly time. So again, those are just some examples. There's more in the rules document and we're looking for, for your innovative uh, approaches to sustainability or, or life cycle uh, innovations. Next slide. Um, so for the technical innovation section for connected systems, we're looking for technical innovations that go beyond those prescriptive minimum requirements and the points that were outlined uh, earlier uh, in the presentation. So. These technical innovations are um, gonna be scored by the expert reviewer panel, and there's no required minimums. And so each of the bullet points here can earn you up to five points. So you can get a total of 15 points that can be awarded for technical innovation by the expert reviewer panel. Um, and again, this would be based on the quality of the content, the approach, the arguments, and on that specific scoring statement. And those scoring statements are written about uh, ease of installation and use compatibility and interoperability, and value proposition and cost. Um, so I'll give a couple examples from the rules document that might fall into this category. Um, so for instance, this could be an innovation that simplifies the connected lighting system installation, configuration, or commissioning, or an innovation that improves the ability to identify and diagnose problems that might occur during a connected lighting system installation, or uh, maybe one that improves the value proposition of connected lighting systems for building owners and decision makers, um, something that's clearly articulated and quantifies the value. So um, those are just some examples. Again, there's more in the rules document. So I encourage you to go look there. And the last slide here is um, about connected systems, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so um, this is uh, identical to the DEI section uh, in the Luminar track. Um, but just, yeah, some points I wanted to reiterate. Um, it, it's subjective. It's going to be scored by the uh, expert reviewer panel uh, based on the criteria laid out in the rules document. There's no required minimums. And we're looking for policies and programs that promote the representation and participation of different groups of individuals. Um, so each of the bullet points here can earn you up to five points for a total of 15 points that could be awarded for a DEI approach. And next slide. Okay, so when you signed up for this webinar today, you might have also seen that there's two other webinars coming up. And so we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, both the DEI um, diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements and um, the product life cycle and sustainability requirements. So there's one um, webinar for each of those topics. Um, and I'm going to drop the links into the chat in just a minute so that you can easily find those. Um, so we thought that there might be more questions on these areas. Um, there's a lot of new information in here and some big changes from the previous concept rules document. Um, so I will uh, drop those into the chat right now so that you can click on those and follow up. Okay, back to you, Gabe. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, so just a, one more slide here to talk about what are the key, key dates and what do you need to submit? For this phase, we're requiring an intent to submit form to be completed for anyone that submits an entry. This is non-binding, so if you complete this form but do not end up submitting an entry, that, that's not a problem. Uh, the forms are due January 13th of next year, and then the actual prototype submissions and all documentation are due in May, on May 1st of next year. It will take a couple months 
uh, for DOE to evaluate the submissions and we anticipate announcing winners in July of 2023. Um, what do you need to submit? Well, it's three complete working prototypes and documentation. And the documentation includes a cover page, PowerPoint summary slide, technical documentation such as testing results, um, a completed technical performance and scoring form that's not a big deal. It basically is going to summarize the performance and prescriptive points earned that are claimed by the competitor. And then a description of key innovations and features that you want to highlight for the expert reviewer panel and DOE. Um, DOE is very sensitive to competitor IP concerns. All IP is owned by the competitor. It's not owned by DOE. And DOE will keep all submission information confidential with exception to the cover page and the PowerPoint summary slide content, the competitor decides what information they'd like to share on those documents. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Emily who will give us an overview of Hero X. Thanks, Gabe. That was really helpful information. All right, so as Gabe mentioned, um, Real quick, and I'll show you exactly where this is on HeroX, but the official rules for the prototype phase are available online at our HeroX website. We'll drop the link in the chat in just a moment here, um, but it's under the resources page. And again, I'll show you how to get there. And then we're going to do a quick um, demo, oh, and the link is on the screen here as well. Um, we're now going to move into a brief overview of the HeroX website. Bear with me for just a moment. I'm going to share my screen so we can do a live click through. Great. All right. So when you go to HeroX.com forward slash LPRIZE, um, no dash, all one word, this is the page that is going to come up for you. Um, I am signed into an account, but if you have not signed into a HeroX account, you will be asked to before you are able to interact with the prize. It's a really easy sign up, name, email, um, a quick acknowledgement of terms and conditions. Um, from here, you will be able to follow the prize. Following the prize is really important because you're able to get all of the um, most up-to-date information and updates about the prize, reminders about submission, deadlines. If you are at all interested in um, competing the prize, following the prize, generally keeping up with it, I would encourage you to, at very least, create a Hero X account and click on follow today so that you don't miss any important information. Um, next, if you are interested in competing in the prize and submitting that intent to submit form that Gabe just talked to us about, once you've created a HeroX account and followed the prize, you will then click on this button here, solve this challenge. You will then go to a competitor agreement, hit accept, and then you will have the option to either create your own team or join an existing team if someone has already created an account and formed a team, or you can just compete individually. You can always join or create teams later on. Um, then it will take you back to the home page, but now you'll see you'll have two new options here. One is begin entry and another is join a team. To submit the intent to submit submission form, you will want to click on begin entry. That will take you directly to the intent to submit submission form. We will make the um, prototype submission form, that broader one that you'll have to submit later, um, available to all registered um, eligible, eligible competitors. Also, you can join a team if you'd like. Um, and those are, those are your main steps to if you want to compete in the prize. So create a HeroX account, follow the prize, and then submit your intent to submit form via this begin entry button. And as a reminder, that intent to submit needs to be submitted no later than January 13th, 2023. Um, some additional resources that you will be able to see on HeroX. On the first tab here, these are tabs going across the middle of the page. Click on overview. You'll be able to see an overview of the prize as well as the timeline. Um, here's the guidelines. It essentially just points to the official rules document, but also has our L prize email address. If you have any questions, concerns, want to send us some feedback, um, I would encourage you to make use of that email address. We also have the timeline. We keep this up to date with all the happenings that are going on with the prize. 
updates. This is where you can find any background information, any updates, reminders, well posted here. If you're following the prize, you also get emailed notification about it, which is really helpful. But if you miss anything or you want to get up to date, this is the place to do it. Here is the discussion form tab. Um, this includes um, uh, all of the Q&As that have been submitted so far in technical teams, prize administration, um, DEI, we answer it all here. You can certainly submit additional questions um, here, and this is where we will also be posting the Q&A from today's webinar. Again, we will email you as soon as that's up. You click on the Teams tab, you can see everyone who is following the prize as well as our finalists from the concept phase. Congratulations again to all of our concept phase winners. You can also peruse the entries that we received in, a, in the concept phase if you're interested. And then here under the resources tab, this is really important. You'll be able to see the official lighting prize rules. If you just click on that and then click on that, it will take you directly to the rules document. And then you can also see other important information, such as the teaming RFI, the teaming RFI response form, which we've spoken about, as well as the official comment form for the manufacturing and installation phase of the prize. Um, so that is a quick overview of HeroX. Of course, if you have any questions, concerns, drop that in the Q&A. We're here to support you. Send us an email at lprize at nrl.gov and we will certainly get you an answer if you ever get lost or you forget any of this information. All right, Gabe? I'm sorry, I seem to have lost my interface here. <laughs> We're just gonna show the, the closing slide that um, shows uh, um, the email address. And uh, we're just gonna go into a Q&A period here and answer uh, some of the questions that we received. Uh, Emily did just show the Hero X forum, and for a lot of the questions that we've received so far, uh, you'll see answers to those over the coming days and weeks. We'll make sure to answer uh, pretty much everything that that came in. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of these that we that we got here. Um, we are getting a number of questions uh, asking about uh, where to get some of the referenced interoperability standards, um, the, the DALI and NEMA ANSI C137.4, um, where and how to access uh, the test procedures for those standards or service providers that can provide that testing, and some questions about the, the cost of purchasing standards and conducting that testing. And um, so we're gonna answer that through the forum, so stay tuned. Um, in the coming days and weeks for answers on that. But I wanted to make sure and acknowledge that because there's a few questions that uh, came in around that. Uh, another question that we got here is, um, I don't see it mentioned, but it is, is it also true that Zaga Book 20 interoperability is a requirement for the connected systems track? Um, Basically, yes, this is the, the best answer for that. Um, connected systems uh, need to provide a sensor that fits into a, a sensor port in a luminaire that meets either the Zaga 20 standard or certain shapes from the NEMA 20,000-2021 standard. Um, it turns out, you know, some of those shape, sensor port shapes and sizes from uh, the Zaga 20 standard and the NEMA standard are actually identical. Um, but there's uh, at least one other shape that's allowed that's only in the, the NEMA document. So that's the first part. And the second part is, th is that that sensor required for the connected systems track uh, does need to have the two wire connector that is specified by Zaga Book 20. So hopefully I answered that one okay. Uh, we may put together a, a, a Hero X Forum uh, Q&A on that. All right, in phase two, tunable white does not result in optional points. Will that remain the case in phase three? And uh, it, it may not. That is definitely something that we are uh, seriously considering. And I would 
I think we would ask that if you have any thoughts about how we approach white tunable for the third phase of the competition, there, there are draft uh, rules that have been included with the prototype phase rules. Um, we have a comment period running through the next several months, and we'd love to hear from you uh, with your thoughts about how we approach tunable white for the last phase. Uh, here's a question. Which UL standards do we need to comply with? And uh, actually none for the prototype phase. Uh, when we get to the manufacturing and installation phase, um, uh, the projects, products need to be commercially available and, and you know, able to be installed in buildings in the U.S. And absolutely, there will be safety certifications required. Let's see, Kate, are there any others here that you'd like to take from the question list? There is, there's a couple that came in that I, I, I just posted back that I think it's better to answer in the forum. Yes, I'm seeing a, a bunch of questions with good written, written answers here and, and uh, references to the, the forum. And we'll make sure to answer all of these completely then. Yeah. Yeah, one reason that we like to answer in the forum is that, that it's available to everybody who um, is attending the webinar, but also uh, who's following the HeroX site. So. Um, I put this in the chat, but um, it's great to just, if you follow LPRIZE, if you're not already on HeroX, then you're notified of any new uh, forum Q&A posts, um, or you'll get you know, a notification when the video of this webinar gets posted as well. So um, that's something that we make sure we do is when we get uh, questions that come in, we make sure we uh, put it up on the, on the Q&A so that everybody has access to that same um, question and answer. So I think we're going to go ahead and conclude everybody. Uh, we got five minutes left. You got five minutes extra for your day. Thank you so much for attending. We hope this was helpful and we're really looking forward to your entries and your innovation. If you don't plan to submit an entry, we'd really welcome your help getting the word out about this L Prize. It's really a fantastic opportunity. Uh, I want to remind you that we have two upcoming webinars that Kate mentioned. We've got one on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then there's one on sustainability and life cycle requirements and opportunities of the L Prize. These are uh, both occurring on August 17th, and we hope to see you there. Um, for any questions we didn't answer today, as we said, check out that HeroX forum. It is the place to go for all of your questions and answers. We'll get this up there. It may take us a week or two to answer everything, but it'll be up there. And thank you again, and, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Kate. And thanks to all the participants. <clears throat> I wanted to repeat just once more. I know you already said it, Gabe, but it bears repeating. You do not have to have been a participant in the concept phase for this for the second phase. So if you have any uh, colleagues or friends that, that might need to be reminded of that, please pass that information along. Um, and thank you for joining us. This is uh, hopefully an informative uh, hour spent together. And uh, be sure to follow up on the HeroX website for any of the questions that uh, at this stage still need to be answered.